Hey, welcome to Accidental Gods, to the podcast where we believe that another world is still possible, and that together we can make it happen. I'm Amanda Scott, and I spent the first series of this podcast laying out the basic toolkit that we think is essential to making conscious evolution a possibility. That is, to making our next evolutionary step as a species one of consciousness, consciously chosen. This is the entire premise behind the Accidental Gods website, the membership program, all of the structure, and this podcast. I spent the second season finding people who were using those tools so that they could act as guiding lights for those of us who want to tread on this path. And now in this third season, I had the idea that we were going to lay out a vision for the possible future that we might aspire to, something that would render the old systems obsolete, something that would be so obviously necessary and useful and wonderful that we could go forward to it open-hearted and knowing what we were aiming for. And in the first couple of episodes, I think we did that. This time round, not quite the same. I start with the premise that to be truly radical is to make hope possible rather than despair convincing. And I still believe that's true. My guest this week, though, is Professor Rupert Reed, Associate Professor of Philosophy at UEA in East Anglia. He's also an activist for the Green Party and one of the key speakers for Extinction Rebellion. He is absolutely immersed in the present moment, in all of the challenges that we face now. And I had this idea that as a philosopher, we could really build together an extraordinary future that would give us something to aim for. And instead, I think we rather made the despair more convincing. So I spent a while deciding whether it was useful to even broadcast this podcast at all. I think that it is, because I think remembering where we are, remembering what we face, remembering the potential for catastrophe is worth it once in a while. I still think that making hope possible is a necessary radical act, and also that hope is possible, that we can get there. And I will explain more of that when we get to the end of this podcast. But in the meantime, people of the podcast, Please do welcome Rupert Reed. So welcome on this Friday morning to Professor Rupert Reed. Rupert, thank you so much for taking time out and for wrestling with the technology to get us going and get us talking again. Now that we're at what seems to be the dribbling end of lockdown, I'm not even sure if lockdown is still happening. How have these last few weeks been for you before we move into how things could be? Well, I'll come clean with you, Mender. Uh, Personally speaking, in many ways, I've had a great lockdown. It's been really bizarre because on the one hand, I've been just so furiously angry with our government for the way it's uh, committed tens of thousands of people to death. And I've been working hard to protest against that and write against that and so on. So I've been very kind of angry at some of the time and, and very concerned about the state of the world in ways that I think we'll get to talk about more generally. Mm. Um, but personally, I found it fine. I was writing a lot. I was catching up a lot. I was hearing the birds sing a lot, literally, as many of us have been mm. experiencing nature in my garden, in the local cemetery, which is an amazing wild place where I would go for my daily jog. I was absolutely loving the absence of uh, cars on the street and planes in the sky uh, above me and noticing the better air quality. There have been many reasons for those of us not in the front line or ill or dying. There have been many reasons, it seems to me, to find the past time, the past few months actually pretty wonderful. Um, And I think there's a very, very powerful message there. If only we were doing a more strong job as a society at heeding that message. Yes. Yes. So there are places I want to go in terms of spirituality and sacredness, but actually given that we're here and that this is the moment now, there was an article in The Guardian today, so today's Friday the 12th of June, saying that 
the CO2 output has spiked up again after two or three months of it falling because of lockdown. And you wrote a comment on that on Facebook saying, this is the last boat. We need to get on the boat to a different future, which I imagine anybody listening to this podcast is on board with that or they wouldn't have got this far. So, and it tags along with you having written a book called The Civilization is Finished, which we talked about in our previous podcast. Yeah. And so I'm wondering, from where we are now, do you see a way forward where if we were all, for whatever reason, got onto the same boat, stopped obsessing about fucking statues and whether they need to come down, they clearly all need to come down. Let's stop worrying about that because we're in the middle of the sixth mass extinction <laughs> and we have been given a gateway to a world that could be different and we seem to be closing that gate. Have you in any way seen a way forward to opening that gate and creating a different world? Well, what a beautifully put question. Uh, I've been trying to uh, keep the gate open and encourage people to walk through it. The, this amazing portal, this gateless gate that uh, we're sort of still somehow in. Uh, for example, in my piece, 24 Theses on Corona, which is sort of the prayer yes. that I wrote for what should happen uh, at this time. I think that this time of, of pause, this time of lockdown has been a sort of sacred space for uh, for many of us in itself um, and the opportunity to reflect on what's really important. I think that we have as a species and as a society learned something about our vulnerability, which is enormously powerful. We've experienced emergency. We've experienced it together. I think it's been very beautiful the way actually that people have to a very large extent been working to or perhaps finding it natural to be together in this time and of course the great irony is we haven't been together physically but i always use the term physical distancing rather than the social distancing because it seems to me that socially yes we have actually been brought closer together not least by things like the mutual care networks and the nhs clap so all the materials as it were are, are there in order for us to make more of a transition uh, at this point. And I've also been working with Extinction Rebellion on, you know, protesting against the bailouts that are happening and arguing for this to be the, the green transition that it should be. The Everything is in place in a certain sense for us to, to make the kind of change that we need to make. But it seems that we're unable to do it. Of course, one of the main reasons we're unable to do it is simply the enormous power of those interests that don't want us to, to do it. Interests in favor of the status quo that are trying to pull us back into how we were uh, before. But I think that there is still a, a chance. But as you say, the the window is is closing. The gate is is closing. We cannot allow that to happen. And so how do we find leverage for those who clearly want to maintain the status quo? Because like you, I I loved lockdown and, and I feel very guilty saying that. And our I kind of go-to metaphor is we're not living on the 10th floor of a tower block with an abusive husband and six children, in which case I am absolutely certain that lockdown was unmitigated yeah. hell. But the answer to that is not to change lockdown, it's to change the nature of living on a 10th floor of a tower block with an abusive partner and six children so that it isn't unmitigated hell. And I haven't met anybody yet who doesn't want this to be a moment of change, but I think that's a, a reflection on my bubble because I go to the local village shop and I buy the Guardian and I look at the front page of the mail and clearly the mail wants us to go back to business as usual at the fastest possible pace. And they must be reflecting the people in power. And I'm thinking you, I believe, went to college, the same college as Boris Johnson at the same time, which is yeah. kind of amazing. So you have some kind of insight into the thought processes that keep the people who currently hold the reins of power in place. What avenues are open to ordinary people to shift their viewpoint at this moment? Well, there are many things that uh, that we can do, as there always are, more than 
than we think. There's the old fashioned things, which are still worth doing, like lobbying your MP. There's talking to your neighbors and being busy on social media. Then there are things which probably have more leverage, such as what you do in your workplace, because this is a moment of potential huge transition in workplaces. If we manage to seriously reduce the amount of commuting that happens, for example, right now, that will be a huge step forward. And I think that is uh, possible. Then, of course, there are more full-on measures which are absolutely called for at this time. This is a absolutely the importance of this moment, this this year, th- this summer. Honestly, it cannot be overestimated. One is always inclined to say that, but I really believe that this is it. That the the, the last boat to for a possibility of a of a transition which does not involve very very massive hardship suffering and probably death is is upon us uh so and i'm not the only one saying this although i think i do feel it a bit more sharply than most people do this is very much the view of my friend and colleague jonathan porritt it's very much the view of secretary general of the un antonio guterres and and many many others so it it has to happen now. The, the more full-on things that have to happen now are things like activism through Extinction Rebellion. We need to be doing physically distanced protests right now to make clear that we will not go back, no going back, no bailouts for business as usual. Instead, we need to bail out a plan for people and planet. And in that context, you ask about what the uh, what those who are, quote, in charge, unquote, uh, want to do. Um, I think they too realize, at least to to, to some extent dimly, uh, that this is a moment for, for opportunity uh, and for change. And there are people even in the conservatives who are waking up to this. For example, I've been working a tiny bit with Lord Randall, Theresa May's um, environment advisor, uh, when she was uh, prime minister, uh, who is, of course, uh-huh. conservative. Uh, and he kind of uh, gets it, but the, <laughs> but kind of getting it at this stage, you know, is that not a bit late? To uh, well, kind of absolutely. It? And and Michael Gove gets it a bit less. Michael's an old friend, and Boris gets it a, a bit less. Um, and then there are other conservatives who literally, you know, don't get it at all. Uh, and they, I think, include uh, Cummings. Well, he's not really a conservative, um, and many of no, but the... he does seem to hold power. Yes, indeed. Uh, and he's clearly people... having his strings pulled by people who, who are way above him on some kind of pecking order. And many of the figures in the in the cabinet. And, and this is uh, this is a government, and of course, Trump in America. It's even worse that um, is uh, very attuned to the interests of big money, uh, and and that's kind of it, really. Um, so is there so, a way that we can reach big money? Because that seems to me that the mm. politicians that we have at the moment are puppets. It, yeah. Maybe I'm being conspiracist, but it does seem to me that they don't have a, an original thought to share between them. And therefore, we need to reach the people who are pulling the strings. Yeah, absolutely. Have you seen any chinks of light in ways that we could be doing that? Well, there are some chinks of light. So you've Mark Carney, for example, has moved uh, quite a long way and he's worth um, pressuring. We need to pour pressure onto the Bank of England. That's a very good target for Extinction Rebellion type action at the moment, because on the one hand, the Bank of England are saying, look, we've got to have a proper green recovery, as many people are saying. But on the other hand, the Bank of England have been literally bailing out the airlines and the oil companies Hmm. and so on during the last week away from the glare of publicity. So it's an incredible kind of uh, two-facedness. So we need to have a radical... uh, action and now is the is the time for people to in a physically distanced way start doing that or to do it virtually i'm working with people in extinction rebellion who are trying to get to the big oil companies and big finance behind the scenes and that's very worth doing but you know mm. manda in terms of in the context of this podcast of this remarkable idea of, of us being accidental gods and what we're going to do about it it seems to me that that the greatest power of all at this moment is for us to really wake up to and realize just how uh, dire things are and start to come clean as as I'm doing, as you've noticed, um, that actually the, the boat is leaving the harbor right now um, for 
any chance of a transition or transformation which is not going to be extremely difficult and unpleasant. Mm. And that very realization, the very realization that basically we're losing our last chance right now, that, of course, actually is our best chance. That's the, the paradox of our situation as it always is, that fully waking up to and fully perceiving the horror of the situation, which most of us, including I really mean most of us, you know, most yeah. of us greenies or, or eco-spiritual types and so on, are very unwilling to do, that actually going through that realization is the best chance of all of unleashing the uh, the saving power that still, I believe, lies in the danger that we are in the middle of. Okay, yes, and that I'm guessing our starting point for that is to read the Deep Adaptation paper, because for all that it's now four years old, it does lay out in really quite stark terms the, the closeness that we are to the tipping points, how close we are to the tipping points, and how horrendous the tipping points will be. In terms of people waking up to this, what else, other than listening to you, because I'm thinking most of us are there, what we need is the general narrative to wake up to that. Mm -hmm. While we have the BBC and Sky and Channel 4 who are letting themselves be dragged down rabbit holes about whether Dominic Cummings went to Barnard Castle or not, they're not starting every item with and we are this much closer to the edge of extinction, which one thinks they would be if they actually understood. How do we reach those who shape our narratives? Mm -hmm. By the way, the Deep Adaptation paper is still actually only two years uh, ago, but uh, perhaps it feels like is four it? years. Uh, Gosh, <laughs> right. Okay, yes, it does. Okay. <laughs> All right. It's even more timely than I thought, but yes, it's... Yeah, right yeah. Uh, and my difference from uh, Jim Bendel, the author of Deep Adaptation, has always been that I thought it was... Um, not right to say, as he says in that paper, that uh, collapse is inevitable and that it's inevitable within a 10-year period. But what I'm saying today is it, it's looking more and more as though um, what he said was uh, prescient. I'm still not uh, going to go with a 10-year with a timetable, but we are getting to the, the point where um, it becomes increasingly Im implausible to imagine that we're going to get through this without at least some kind of very serious partial collapse events in countries like this one, uh, never mind, let alone in, in uh, countries in the in the global south. Mm. So you ask, um, OK, how do we get this through into the general culture and through the media and so on more? And I'd say... Again, we can start with small things like, you know, anyone who knows someone in the media you should you should pressure them and speak truth to them. Uh, should you should complain and write and contact uh, programs like um, um, what's it called? Um, feedback BBC feedback, and, uh, yep. yeah, things like that. Um, but then moving to a somewhat to uh, a bigger um, picture of what might be uh, transformative. Um, Again, it seems to me that actually facing up to climate and ecological reality and drawing the appropriate conclusions in terms of the way that one speaks, the way that one feels, which of course includes a, a very great deal of, uh, of emotional pain and suffering and despair, um, the sharing of that, the sharing of that with each other and the sharing of that beyond our own uh, bubble, as you put it, into, into broader places, the turning to questions of things like, well, if I really mean this, <laughs> and I do, then what does this mean in terms of thinking about um, how I'm planning for the future, uh, building community, um, doing a bit of uh, prepping, uh, that kind of mm. thing. Um, those are the kind of things that when one starts to do them, when one actually allows the emotions to move through, when one actually starts to change one's plans and to share with others the, the fact that one is changing one's plans in those ways, that's what uh, I think breaks through the defenses of increasingly large numbers of people. If somebody hears you saying periodically, God, it's getting really bad, I'm really worried about the future, I think that has a lot less impact than if they actually um, perhaps see you break down in tears about it, mm. or if they actually see you, um, uh, whatever, joining a, a group uh, who are building a community of small holdings or something because you're actually saying, 
well, this is a good thing to do anyway, but the real reason we're being pushed to do this now, even though it's not necessarily what we wanted to be our first priority or where our top skill set lies, is that we think that this is actually uh, necessary given the trajectory of um, society. And it, it seems to me that it is possible that um, more of a shift in that kind of uh, direction in terms of what people actually um, show uh, and do um, could have quite a powerful um, awakening effect. I hope so. I found, because I'm having conversations with publishers and people around publishing, and the conversation goes, why would I write a book that will probably take four years to write and will probably not make a material difference to the future of the world? That seems to me pointless. Yeah. And and I hear or I feel a cognitive dissonance with them because their world is so wrapped up in the problems of publishing. People aren't reading very much. How do we get people to read? That the you know books might not be the future. And and if they are, they probably don't need to be fictional books about World War II, really. Um doesn't it it kind of glances off, I think. Mm. I would yeah. like to believe that it sinks in at some level, that you know, it is far more important that we begin to build regenerative agriculture in the Clon Valley and that we create marches grow local and all of the things that we're trying to do here and that if I have an iota of spare energy, that's where it's going. Um until the point where I can't eat anymore because I have no more money, at which point I may have to write a book. So it there is a lot of stuff wrapped up in that is I'm wondering how we step deeper. Mm. So I listened yesterday to the On Being podcast with Resna Menachem, who is a therapist. He works very deeply with polyvagal theory, and he's deeply embedded in how do we bring the racial issues to the front in America. He's American. And the podcast was recorded back at the beginning of lockdown and then played this week when it was obviously immensely timely. And his argument, he had many arguments, but one of them was, it's no good passing laws or getting people to come to meetings where you go, you know, integration is a good idea, diversity is a good idea, being nice to each other is a good idea, because it doesn't change anything until you have changed the bodily felt sense of how people are. We need to go much, much deeper than simply having conversations either within our echo chamber or, or even on the margins of our echo chamber. And I wonder if we bring this to the climate emergency, how can we reach deeper into people to the point where the reality becomes a felt reality rather than simply an intellectual exercise? Mm. Yeah, look, these are great questions. Going back to where you started there, you were asking about, well, you know, does it really make sense to to do a, a book on this or something, which is going to take four years? So I do think the question of time horizons is a, is a good one now. I mean, in this world situation that we're in now, four years, as we said earlier, is kind of an eternity uh, in the sense that... Um, Maybe we've only got uh, um, eight years before uh, we experience a collapse, or even if it's even if it's uh, uh, eighteen years, or even twenty-eight years. I mean, four years is still a pretty significant percentage of that, and a hell of a lot will have changed and either deteriorated, or stabilized, or conceivably improved uh, within that time. And more generally, I think what you're kind of evoking there is a kind of crisis of meaning, which I'll be frank with you again, as I, as I generally am, uh, which I'm experiencing uh, at the moment as things in this in this semi post COVID moment seem to start to to slip away with us and to slip back to something a sort of in some ways improved and in some ways worsened. Look at you know the increasing numbers of cars we like to have uh, post COVID moment. I think to experience that crisis of meaning is one of the most powerful and necessary things we can probably do at the moment. And to allow ourselves to be for a, for a while um, in this kind of uh, diminishing lockdown uh, summer, uh, and still a moment for many of us of, to some extent, pause, um, uh, a moment where we, we still have, I think, more of a capacity to uh, reflect uh, than we normally do. So turning 
from that to the question of so how do we land this with more people who with whom it's it's not yet kind of really uh, landed so again i i think it's about um finding ways of uh, of breaking through the kinds of resistances which are as you imply extremely easy to maintain um if this stays at the level of an intellectual conversation mm. so that's why i think that uh, emotionality is extremely important that's why in my talks for example i often seek uh, to evoke uh, uh grief um perhaps despair um certainly uh fear because um fear is not just um an unhealthy emotion fear fear is also um irras- irrational uh emotion and if you're not afraid some of the time by the situation that we're in then you're not paying attention and that of course is what it's all about it's about truly truly uh paying attention and seeking to uh, uh facilitate others uh, in doing so and that seems to me is a is the essence of the the body's at for path at this time as perhaps it always has been but very very certainly uh, uh at this time so um emotionality and uh, and the unexpected to encourage people to move out of their normal comfort zone uh and so the unexpected for example includes uh people like me or people in extinction rebellion saying not just look come on we've got to move a lot faster to mitigate and prevent climate catastrophe but also you know what um it's too late to do this as fully as we were hoping um uh 10 years ago or even 2 years ago um yeah of course we need to uh, to to mitigate um our uh, climate deadly emissions but part of what mitigation really means now um is the sort of literal meaning of the word which is simply making things less bad not making things brilliant but making things uh less bad i'm speaking here of course on the uh, material plane at some level uh, spiritually it's possible for things to be uh, wonderful or even uh, in a certain sense perfect uh, while they're uh, deteriorating uh, materially but what i'm what i'm saying is that we need to find ways of and and i think we we have access to to those ways and i've been trying to describe some of them mm. of breaking through some of people's normal uh, defenses to uh, force them to confront the uh, the materiality of of the decline that is setting in and to get people to 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 face um the fact that we are on a path of 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 what i sometimes call civilizational uh, descent uh, now um uh, people have talked for many years about the need for energy descent which is absolutely uh, correct but it's now i think clear that uh, the civilization uh, that we are in um is uh, is going to um, is going to decline and and that um uh, descent um the way to handle it um is by finding ways of getting ourselves and others around us to uh, be willing to countenance um energy descent and other forms of of such descent and to the extent that we're able to do that uh, globally nationally regionally locally in the neighborhood uh, uh, in our own homes to the extent that any of those things are possible then um the the material setting for the coming uh, long emergency will be uh, less bad okay gosh there's so much in there so looking down the list of notes that i've just written to myself in order this is a question that i asked for myself because i hear you about reaching the grief and the despair and the fear i'm also deeply embedded in neuroscience and particularly at the moment polyvagal theory because it it's relatively new and it's relatively interesting and my understanding such as it is at the moment is that fear and creativity are mutually incompatible on a on a physiological basis if we lock people into fear there is a far greater tendency that they'll become tribal that will end up with what we see in the states where there are armed militias in some cases taking over the centers of their state capitals and that's not a creative way forward i'm not suggesting that you have an answer to this but i'm wondering i'm remembering raymond williams who was a wonderful old socialist in wales who said to be truly radical is to make hope possible rather 
than despair convincing. Yeah, but you know, I've been thinking quite a lot about that saying of Raymond Williams's recently, and I think that it's it's kind of out of date, actually. Okay, he that, was speaking to socialism back in the 30s, I think. Yeah, yeah, sure. I think it it, it may have been uh, just the right thing to say uh, in his time. Um, okay. But I think it's not now. I'm, of, I'm of course, not talking about locking people into fear. Okay. What I am talking about is... Um, being willing to experience the uh, the amount of fear, as it were, that it is uh, uh, only appropriate to experience, and the same with despair. Um, uh, here, I've been very influenced by my teacher, Joanna Macy, who, of course, for many, many years has been pioneering this work, which she used to call uh, despair work. And basically, <laughs> her kind of starting point was, look, we are feeling fear. We are feeling uh, despair. If we try to convince ourselves, to, to use Williams's word, that it would be better not to feel these things, then actually this is mm. a form of of denial and suppression, and the and the the repressed uh, will uh, return in um, unwise uh, ways. Let's actually feel it, and that's the only way we get to move through it. But we don't get to move through it and leave it behind once and for all. It's mm. gonna it's, it'll keep on uh, coming back because there's the cause. Uh, for it to to come back. So I want to say, as it were, in response to Raymond Williams right now, what's wrong with despair? Isn't despair actually exactly what we need to not not get stuck in, but to to feel to feel perhaps you know really badly to feel for quite a while to move through to pass into something different, and then it'll probably come back again uh, at some point because because that's real. Um, we have to, a way I've started putting it recently is that we have to allow our desperate hopes themselves to despair. And only if we do that will we be able to find in the kind of way that, for example, Jonathan Lear, my uh, philosopher colleague, uh, describes, um, to feel, uh, to build a, a radical hope, um, what uh, mm. Joanna Macy calls um, active hope, hope that isn't the sort of pining um, which is really just an excuse excuse for inaction, but hope that is actually Im- embedded and uh, and embodied uh, and and realistic. Not realistic in the way that our conventional hegemonic culture encourages us to be quote realistic unquote, but realistic in a far bolder sense, but one that nevertheless recognizes some things that some thresholds uh, that have passed and some limits um, to what is now. Um, possible. You know, it could have been possible for us to have a sort of green industrial um, transition um, if we'd have really got serious about this after the limits to growth people gave us their very clear warning uh, almost uh, 50 years ago uh, uh, now. Um, uh, I'm not certain that it would have been possible, but it's possible it would have been, would have been possible. Let's put it that way. Um, but now it's kind of not. Uh, and so that and so to to put to, um, to make a concrete sort of point of political economy now, there are a lot of calls now for a green new deal and a green industrial revolution. But we have to be very careful what we wish for at this point. Mm. If there is an enormous um, investment in kind of mega industrial so-called green um, uh, infrastructure. Um, and if it's quite uncritical, um, then actually we're going to be using up some of the last um, uh, period of relative uh, stability. Because believe you me, you know what's coming is likely to be a lot less stable than what we have now. We could likely be using up some of the last of our literally uh, capital of, of all kinds um, on something which cannot actually be sustained. Now, this, I think, is the point that um, that Michael Moore et al. were trying to make in the film. Um, uh, Planet of the Humans, a film which I've argued is uh, grossly wrong and unhelpful in a number of ways, as has been pointed out. But I think the reaction against it has been, in some quarters, has been too negative. There, A lot of people are reacting against it purely and completely negatively because they are bought into the idea of solar panels covering you know, vast areas of, uh, of our our deserts and wind turbines covering vast areas of our countryside and of our of our seabeds and so on and so forth in ways that are likely not to be sustainable and in ways that could be extremely um, ecologically 
damaging. We have to escape uh, the mindset that that holds that we're going to try to find a way of keeping this civilization juddering forward in roughly its current form. Mm. That might have been possible uh, a long time ago through a green transition. It isn't possible uh, now. And what we what we have to embrace instead is a, a more challenging and difficult, but in many ways also a more rewarding path of uh, of energy descent, of uh, relocalization, um, of living uh, closer uh, to nature. To the extent that we, we build in doing these kinds of things and preparing for these kinds of things uh, in this pivotal decade of the 2020s. To that extent, um, the world is going to be a better place for our, our children, but also, I would argue, for us. Yes, yes, for everybody who's still alive. Because listening to you, so I, I've gone through one of those despair and then agency sine waves. I, I still like Raymond Williams. I think if we put active as an adjective before hope, he hasn't said anything that you haven't just said, because I think, I don't suppose he was suggesting people didn't despair. And I'm not thinking either you or I suggest people don't despair. But my experience and my understanding of fundamental human nature is that we have to have some degree of agency. Yeah. My Because my default is if there is only despair. And actually, if I look at my life really critically, the best possible thing I could do would be to find a rope and a beam in a barn as we leave this podcast. Because being on this planet is not helping it. Unless I can find a way wherein I genuinely believe that my presence is on the positive side of the greater balance, then I ought not to be here. And that's been a metric in my own life for as long as I can remember being able to think. What's mm. changed within me is my metric of what do I think is on the positive side of the balance, and that's changing quite radically over over the last few months even. But if people listening to this are undergoing the same metric, if we leave people staring at despair and also staring at a future that is frankly unspeakably bad, the you know, the one, I can't remember who it was, it was a podcast I listened to where it, fundamentally we're all going to end up being kebabbed over piles of burning tires by our bigger and nastier neighbours. If that is our future, then frankly leaving now while we have some choice of how we leave would probably be the most rational idea. I still entertain a belief, largely based in my spirituality, I would suggest, that we can do what Buckminster Fuller said and build a future that renders the old reality obsolete. And that is one that, in which people can flourish. So I'm wondering, first of all, whether how that lands with you. And then second, if you and I were to sit down now and we're given the reins of the world, how would we create a future that averts the piles of burn, burning tires and the kebabs? Mm. Well, that last question is in a way quite easy to answer. You know, <laughs> like like a, a number of uh, of colleagues, I've been working for for many years on uh, on grand plans for <laughs> how they, everything should be should be better. Um, and uh, so, for example, I've contributed to Green Party manifestos, which are often uh, lovely documents of, of how everything should should be, which could be uh, in theory could be uh, implemented. Um, but I do think we have to be uh, uh, pretty clear, as I say, um, that uh, the time when those kinds of manifestos could be uh, implemented, if they ever could be, uh, is slipping away from us or probably basically already has. I mean, one way I sometimes put this is um, if uh, we were not going to uh, have a civilized, be part of this civilization um, that ends, um, then we would have elected uh, green uh, governments um, about um, 35 years ago, uh, hmm. which is a long time, um, frankly. Um, now, uh, your point, Manda, about, look, but can't we find a sort of Buckminster Fuller type uh, approach that actually builds uh, the alternative world sort of more or less from below? Um yeah, I mean, I agree with that. And and that's, I think, part of what we've been talking about, really, off and on the last 20 minutes or so. Um, that's part, at least, of what um, all of us uh, should be doing. 
Uh, and of course, it's exactly what um, many people in um, the transition towns movement and uh, permaculture and uh, polyculture and so on have been trying to do for a while. Uh, and I think those things will only grow. Uh, and that's excellent. Um, I think we shouldn't be under the illusion, however, that those things are going to um, completely uh, replace uh, the existing uh, uh, power structure uh, and uh, setup of society. The latter uh, may end up um, evaporating entirely and leaving only us lot, as it were, with our alternative, more smaller scale uh, society. But that process is going to be drawn out and difficult. Now, here's one reason why it's going to be difficult uh, and why and drawn out and why I'm not an advocate of the sort of Schmachtenberger phase shift type um, scenario for how we might be able to make this change. There's a crucial difference between the world conceived of kind of purely physically and the world conceived of as a human space. And the difference is that when part of the human world uh, starts to move in a particular direction, uh, the other part of the human world or parts um, can notice that and respond. And that response can be good or it can be bad. Um, mm. And unfortunately, it is certain that to some extent, the response that will be made to um, moves we make to create uh, an alternative uh, world and to build that world and to live in that world, it is certain that to some extent the response to that will be bad. Why? Well, one crucial reason for why is the market system that we have uh, created and that is now frankly out of control, you know, beyond the control of governments, beyond the control of, of very rich people, even although they have more influence over it than most of us do on a day-to-day -day, uh, basis. But it's not in anybody's uh, control. Could it not be brought under somebody's control? Well, there are way, there are things that we could do to to try to bring it uh, under control. And many of those things we, we should indeed be doing. For example, um, uh, the kind of proposals made by my colleague Richard Murphy to uh, hmm. and Nicholas Shackson to uh, to rein in um, the offshore world and to um, uh, give governments a, a better um, handle of and share of uh, tax revenue uh, again uh, that would be one kind of key example of the kind of change that needs to be made to to, to release uh, the markets but to suppose that 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 could uh, that that could happen with any uh, rapidity is is entirely uh, delusive in, in a world where big money has such vast power and also where you have people like uh, Trump and Johnson and so on who are friends of those interests not enemies of those interests um, in government. Anyway, the point that I was about to make was that the problem with uh, an unleashed market uh, system is that, and this was the, the basis of my argument against Rob Hopkins many years ago when I said, look, the transition towns movement is great, but unless it has some kind of broader political context, it can never fully succeed. The problem is that when we start living more, you know, off grid and energy descending and so on and so forth, the market receives that as a, an impersonal price signal. The market receives that as a signal of, oh, well, it's fine now. There's there's more oil available than there was uh, before um, because uh, these people uh, in Totnes and whatever are, are, not, uh, are not using it uh, now. So we can just use uh, more of it and we can just splash out. Um, it's, uh, it's become uh, cheaper uh, again. So these kinds of uh, systemic effects that occur through through the uh, the horrendous economics of a of a neoliberal capitalist market um, system um, get in the way of the possibility of the the sort of purity that we could imagine to, to a kind of phase shift approach if we focus on it from a sort of consciousness only perspective or think of it purely by analogy to changes in a physical system there is a there is a counter reaction in other parts of of, of that system. And frankly, that's just the beginning. I mean, that's a kind of um, uh, that's a kind of effect which nobody's particularly intending. It just happens through the market. There will also be people who are actually, you know, outraged and annoyed and so on and so forth when they see others uh, living closer to the land and rejecting their institutions and so on and so forth. So we just can't expect um, the the transition that we're hoping for and that we're trying. Uh, to build, to be anything other than extremely painful and difficult uh, uh, and uh, resisted. 
at one point in the past, it might have been. But now um, we've gone beyond that to a point where various kinds of conflicts are inevitable. Now, you you then, Manda, say, so look, um, is, is suicide a rational <laughs> option, to put it bluntly? <laughs> yes. Um, and I think it's it's wonderful and, and of, of you to be so honest in saying that and getting us to try to think about it. Uh, as I see it, we're way, way uh, uh, short of, of that point, if that point were, were ever to arise. And there's all sorts of things that could get uh, in the way of that point. Uh, for example, um, we uh, we could decide to seek to find ways of, uh, of defending ourselves. Um, there are all sorts of possibilities uh, there. Uh, another kind of possible scenario which one might imagine is that I, I'm sure that many listeners are familiar with uh, with Starhawk's fantastic uh, novel, mm. The Fifth uh, Sacred Thing. And what that sort of proposes um, is, look, if you're, if you're really, really serious about enough about nonviolence, and if you're willing to suffer a great deal uh, in the process, then it's possible that nonviolence could uh, ultimately change or transform pretty much anything, including extremely horrific militaristic uh, uh, mindsets. And yeah, but it's also I'd, possible that it doesn't. Yes, it's also possible <laughs> that it doesn't. Um, uh, and it's also it's also very important to notice, I think, that the only way she's able to make that remotely plausible um, is by um, showing a path which, as I say, includes a very huge amount of uh, suffering uh, on the part of the uh, on the part of the nonviolent. So, and actually, it, it ignores the history of the Holocaust, where there were you know walls of dead bodies and. And no sense in which the machine that was killing them was taking any notice of that. So I, I'm, I've never. I, I think Starhawk's lovely, and I liked the book, but I didn't didn't strike me as very plausible, to be honest. Yeah, it, it's it's. Let's put it this way: it's not at all clear that there aren't uh, um, human regimes which are impervious to the kind of hope that is invested in a in a novel like that. And I think I think that uh, Hitler's Germany looks like it pretty much definitely was one. And I, I would be inclined to suggest that Trump's America, I'm afraid, mm, uh, yes, is another yeah. and quite possibly uh, Johnson's Britain as well. So this makes our situation, you know, very difficult. And I think the, the very honest questions that you're asking um, are, are well taken. Speaking for myself, um, I find um, uh, enormous uh, strength um, in the kind of uh, spiritual traditions uh, that have influenced me and the spiritual practices that I'm invested in, and quite simply also in the uh, the beauty and the sacredness of uh, of nature, of the earth as a whole, and of specific uh, wild places uh, more specifically. And and at this point, you know, of course, this, that may change. But at this point, I'm inclined to think that those kinds of uh, things will never place me personally uh, in a situation where where I would uh, uh, take the way out that you were describing. Hmm. But, uh, but you know, uh, I might be proved wrong. Yeah. My feeling with that is always the day you realize that it would have been a good idea is the day it's too late. Um, it's kind of preempting that one has always been my my aim. But before we head there, because we're we're running towards the end of our time, but I'm this we've talked about spirituality and sacredness, or you have touched on them tangentially. Before we really go down that route, Joanna Macy's three pillars of the great turning still seem to me an interesting structure and metaphor with which to work. And it seems to me that a lot of the political moves and the actions that XR takes and that we could take come under the rubric of holding actions. Mm -hmm. There are some systems designs and your 24 thesis on, on a pandemic, we're heading towards systems designs. But even Green Manifestos have always seemed to me to be very low on Donella Meadows' 12 levers of change, that we're dealing with iterations of the existing system rather than transforming the system radically mm -hmm. and that we need the systems design that would create radical transformation which is what humanity rising is trying to do and we need the shifting consciousness and so my first question is do you still think those three pillars are right and relevant and if so where would the shifting consciousness from your spiritual perspective take us yeah i do think the three pillars are still relevant However, I do think it's very important to note 
that Joanna's own perspective uh, on them and on the situation has altered uh, quite a bit since she wrote oh, that. Um, right. I met with her and spoke with her about this uh, last year, and her perspective now it, it's you know it's uh, like mine. It's not the, quite the same as as Jen Bendel's. But actually, her perspective and my perspective are pretty similar now, uh, I think. Um, uh, and I think that it would be fair. I don't want to speak for, for her, but I'll just say that I think that, uh, let's put it this way, she is um, a lot less optimistic about the the great turning um, than she was when mm. uh, I first uh, uh, studied with her. Um, I think that um, the way we should probably think about the 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 great turning uh now um is that it is something that we should be in some sense aspiring to and trying to create and that is something that we can uh create on certain scales what i've been trying to suggest is that i think that the 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 notion that there will be one all encompassing great turning that will succeed uh, is no longer um, credible, uh, and I think the uh, the consciousness shift that we should be seeking, uh, we need to think of it um, on a sort of, uh, if you will, a retail basis as much as on what I call a, a whole scale uh, basis. Um, that um, to the extent that we can have a, a change of consciousness in. Uh, in my life and your life and the life of people listening to this podcast and the life of people living in your valley or the life of a third of the people living in your valley or, you know, whatever it is, that's great. Um, and we don't have to think something like um, if we don't do it on a total basis, then we haven't done it at all. And it's a good thing we don't have to think that because it isn't going to happen and, and it's actually a recipe for burnout. And, and that's actually one of my key concerns here, which has been baked into Extinction Rebellion from the beginning, that we need to find ways of ensuring that as individuals and as activists and as uh, as movements, uh, we are not setting ourselves up for burnout. And we will set ourselves up for burnout and we will be unregenerative to the extent that we have chronically uh, unrealistic uh, expectations uh, and are failing to perceive uh, the, the meaning of the of the changes that have been occurring well for a long time and especially those that have been occurring recently which like i say have altered my perspective and have altered uh, joanna's uh, uh, perspective so yeah i think that's my answer to your question if you think it answers it yeah yeah i think it's i i wouldn't agree with you but i think i'm interested in i think we might be end, end up reiterating stuff the meaning of the changes so in the lives of the people listening and in your life, as we move forward from where we are now, where would you invite people to go? So you've spoken about energy descent, relocalization and connecting to nature. With our last few minutes, energy descent is obvious. It just means using a lot less energy, which means a radical transformation of how we live because we have come to live very energy dependent lives. Yeah. Is there a resource that you can point people to to help with energy descent? Oh sure. Um there, there's there's lots of stuff. I mean it, it's integral to uh, to transition towns. Um my colleague Samuel Alexander who uh, did uh, the civilization is finished with me. Uh, he's mm. one of the world's experts on it. You can look at his um uh his books. I'm also thinking Maybe it's worth us after the podcast, Manda, sharing some uh, resources, some links and so on with yes. people to follow up on some of Put in the show notes, that would be about. great. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Also for relocalization, because that again, it's it, it's much the same. It's beginning to buy local food, beginning to do whatever you do within your local area. And yes. yet we are connected by Zoom across the world. So I think, yeah. I think a lot of the reason that people get very stuck is this belief that we're going to end up if not the piles of burning tires and the kebabs, then living in in mud huts, dressing ourselves in the skins of whatever animals we are able to catch, which won't be many because we've lost those skills. So the idea that relocalization can be an improvement on what we have now is something that I think isn't, for me, adequately explored and yet was beginning to become explored during lockdown when 
localization mm. was what happened. And people found, you know, other than the people on the 10th floor of the tower block with the abusive partner, were genuinely finding that their world was improved. So the yeah. radical shutdown of bullshit jobs, you know, finding which jobs are are viable, useful, finding the jobs that that meet the criteria of one's heart's greatest joy meeting the world's greatest need seems to me an absolute key and that we could shift we could shift the markets. I, I keep going back. To, I've got a note now in red. I don't often make notes in red yeah. when I'm talking to somebody. But my note in red, this idea that the market is unassailable seems to me one that was demonstrably disproved during lockdown. Mm, yeah. Um, you know, the, along with there is no magic money tree. And lo and behold, actually, there's yep. a magic money forest. Yes. Um, you know, we do make money up out of nothing and then hand it out. That's been the case for a long time. It's not yep. linked to the gold standard. It's not linked to any possible metric of value. So the market is a human construct. It's not a physical law of nature. And therefore, if the eight richest men in the world, who are all white, most of whom are North American, got together and decided to change it, I guess it would change. You know, it's not. It's not beyond changing. I think one or two of them now are, are Indian, by the way. But yeah, your your oh, point really? is basically well taken. Um, yeah, absolutely. Look, the, the the finding of the magic money tree during lockdown was enormously uh, useful for those of us who've been arguing for years. Like, come on, climate and ecology, it's an emergency. Let's find the adequate resources to deal with it. It's no longer plausible for people to say there just aren't those resources uh, there. I never meant to say, I certainly didn't say that the market was immutable and un unchangeable. It is very much a human construct, although we do need to bear in mind that doesn't mean that it is fully within the powers of uh, polities as they are currently constructed to rein in, um, because it would be very, very difficult uh, if um, any polity wanted to uh, fully rein in uh, its uh, its money markets, etc. Uh, now, because those markets would immediately start betting against the uh, uh, the the state or government or whatever uh, in question. But we could just shut them down. We could shut down the markets tomorrow if we, as a global humanity, chose to. Yeah, but I, I, part of what I've been seeking to say is that, on the one hand, to the extent that it's possible, that it's some, roughly that is is what indeed what we should try to 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 do. Um, but on the other hand, we need to uh, understand that there uh, would be um, enormous uh, and immediate uh, pushback uh, uh, against that. The the power of surely that depends on the narrative that we that uh, the why it's being spun. Because the problem at the moment, one of the many problems, seems to be that our tribal instincts are pretty much unchanged for the last ten thousand years, and we have framed the environmental narrative in tribal terms such that if it were perceived as a tribal instinct that was shutting down the markets, then the tribe that did not perceive it as being on their side would react. And yes, there are many sub-tribes, but there are broadly two. There are those who care about a future in which people flourish and those who care about a future in which they win. Mm -hmm. Which I think... In, Michael Moore, before he went off and did really weird stuff, did a very interesting interview with Steve Bannon asking why does the right win when the left doesn't? And Bannon said broadly, because we on the right know what we want and we know how we're going to get it and we are going for headshots while the rest of you are still playing at pillow fights. Mm. And what they want is a white supremacist patriarchal theocracy and they know exactly how they plan to get it. And they are utterly ruthless in doing so while we're still arguing you know, on the left about, let's not go into all the things that the left argues about, but the the different ways that we might achieve something that we're not even sure what it is that we want to achieve. And if the right perceived the shutting down of the markets as being something that was politically motivated, thereby tribally motivated, then we would see militias on the streets on a scale that even the Black Lives Matter has not yet brought out. Mm -hmm. But if we were to reframe the narrative such that, you know, if it were oh, look, guys, there's a meteorite heading for the planet and shutting down the markets will stop it. Let's let's leave aside that that's a physiological impossibility. Then everybody would be behind it. You know, the numbers of people who were not behind lockdown were tiny yeah. and, and largely shut up quite quickly when the body banks started flowing. Yeah, yeah. And that, again, is great. It's very hopeful. But I think that we... we uh, we need to remember that roughly what you're suggesting, 
Mander, is basically what XR said. Uh, and XR sought to do it in a way that was beyond ideology uh, and that could be very broad-based. And XR but has but had it didn't tremendous... succeed in that. Well, XR is fantastic success um, in changing uh, uh, public opinion and in influencing some of what government and parliament does. But, but virtually nothing in terms of what actually happened on the ground has changed. Uh, and there has also been enormous uh, resistance. And meanwhile, more time uh, has passed. Uh, and in Britain, we've had a general election result, which was absolutely catastrophic. Uh, and now we've had this pandemic, which provided this fantastic opportunity for, uh, for reset. Um, and people have been waking up to what matters under lockdown and waking up to, as you say, why human life is so much more important than uh, GDP numbers and so on. And yet it seems that we are heading back into something not that dissimilar to what we had uh, before. Um, you put these things uh, together uh, and it's just very hard to see uh, what what the grounds is for uh, for uh, optimism of the kind you've just been outlining. Now, one can always say, well, I don't have any grounds. It's purely um, it's purely faith based or counter empirical. Um, but then one has to notice that one can no longer, uh, if one does that, one can no longer take sucker from the success of movements in the past, like um, the civil rights movement, for example, or the people power movement in the Philippines, because one is then saying, I'm not basing things on any evidence. I'm just purely hoping. And that's always open to people to do. But what I'm saying is, Let's be um, a little bit clearer about what it really makes sense now to hope for, partly because if we don't, then there will be, uh, there will be burnout and there will be uh, depression and it will be uh, even worse than if we proceed along the kind of road that I'm proposing. But bear in mind that, that actually in terms of um, optimism, if we compare you and me, Manda, there, there are some, some metrics on which we could describe me being more optimistic than you. So I've said, for example, that I'm less inclined to think that there'll be a point where, where for me, uh, suicide appears the, as a rational uh, outcome. Uh, and yeah, I think my threshold for suffering, <clears throat> sorry, is slightly less than yours. It could be. And of course, you know, you're a woman and I'm a man. There's lots of, lots of things we could go into there to talk about. Um, for me, one um, really wonderful fictional text here is is The Road, uh, both the book and the film, which I discuss mm. in my recent book, uh, A Film Philosophy of Ecology and Enlightenment. And the argument that I make there is that what people usually miss about The Road uh, is that it has a happy ending and that it is actually a redemptive uh, uh, tale. What is it? it? I never got that far. <laughs> right. Uh -huh. That's the first chapter. Yeah, it paints, it you know, an scary. utterly, utterly bleak picture, which uh, which sounds like it stopped you. Um, but, uh, but incredibly, it has a kind of a, a happy ending. And what I think it's really um, uh, about is how it's possible to go through a, a truly... Um, uh, unbelievable uh, horrors, uh, and for and for still that to be worthwhile, and for something uh, good to come out of it, and that's part of the the place where I am uh, now. And uh, I hope that uh, that that kind of, if you will, uh, broadly stoical kind of approach or attitude may be able to become uh, widespread in the years to come, because I think we might need it. We in our tribe, as it were, as, as you put it. Although I would raise a little question mark about the, the way you, you're using the term tribe, because I think you're using it in the way that we normally do, which sort of implies that there's something bad about being a tribe and goes along with this phrase tribalism that we have. But of course, actually, in a certain sense, um, what I'm suggesting when, when I talk about relocalization and so on is that we should we should face the, the fact that although it would be wonderful if we're able to preserve global communication in the future we're moving into, and I hope that we do, and I hope that we can still Zoom with people on the other side of the world and so on, I hope that we'll travel a lot less, and, and, and I, in fact, I know we'll travel a lot less. Uh, you know, a relocalized world is coming in terms of actual movement, and I think that, um, that uh, coronavirus is, is, an, is a harbinger uh, of that. It's coming either because we we more or less choose it intelligently or becomes, because it will get imposed upon us through a brutal collapse event if we try and carry on with the degree of hypermobility we've had. 
But the future that we're going to move into, the the more local uh, future, will be a future where actually the way we live will be a bit more like the way we used to live with tribes, when living in tribes wasn't um, a bad thing. It was simply how it was. Um, and tribes, so long as they're not, you know, super uh, mutually hostile mm. and predatory, um, is actually a way of describing how human beings for many, many um, uh, millennia, um, in some cases, uh, you know, lived uh, lived very well in ways that we could look back to as well as, if you will, look forward to. Yeah, it's it's the not being mutually antagonistic. That, that yeah, really yeah, important. absolutely. So I, I think, think in, in my there. quest for conscious evolution, I definitely want to move beyond the kind of oxytocin dopamine based yeah. metaphors of tribalism to a point where where we have, yeah, where we can retain the best of being connected and not have to use that as a reason to create others who are beyond our tribe with whom we are yeah. antagonistic. Nicely put. Definitely. Yes. So I'm completely aware of the time. This is this is stretched way beyond usual podcast time. It's been really interesting. I, As ever talking to you, I think there's room for at least one, if not two other podcasts where we could have gone down other pathways with other directions. But I think we have to bring it to a close this time. And at some point we'll do podcast number three, where doubtless the world will have changed yet again, turned on its axis yes. and be facing in yet another direction. And we can see Indeed. where we both are in our quest for active hope, because I think the thing that we both have is a sense that hope is an active process. Yes. And where we separate quite widely is that I don't find the road <laughs> in any way a happy thing but and I did not get past chapter one so perhaps yeah you have to, to read the whole thing do I, no, I, don't think, I could read the first <laughs> chapter and the last chapter but I am not going to read the bits in the middle <laughs> because my threshold for suffering is quite clearly a lot lower than yours um anyway Rupert thank you so much it's been really really interesting I love the sense of getting to the edges of where we are and where we think we could be and exploring the possibilities. Um, and yes, thank you thank for you, your honesty. It's really good. Well, I, I think it's been mutual and I love the uh, engaging with the, with with your thinking and with the sort of accidental gods hypothesis, which to me is sort of has, has a massive uh, nugget of truth at the centre of it. So, yeah, it's, it's fascinating to have this discussion. Yeah, I look forward one day to podcast number three. Super. Thank you very much indeed. So that's it for another week. Enormous thanks to Rupert Reed for the depth of his thinking and the raw honesty of it, for his willingness to go to the edges of ourselves and explore what's there. We talked on a bit after the end of the recording and I really wish I'd left the microphone on because we we came to a different place. I think because I genuinely believe that the thing that is missing from all of this is the connection to the web of life and the ability to ask of the rest of the natural world, what do you want of me? And the new directions that the answers to that might yield that will take us beyond where our current thinking limits us. It feels as if we get locked in a box, going round and round, bouncing off the walls of Yes, but this is how things are. And we know how things are. And we know they're not good. But we have the capacity to change. We have the capacity to choose to change. And in doing so, we open the doors to realities that we cannot yet know. So I think in our conditioning of narratives, we need new ones to supplant the road. I am still not planning to read that. So, yes, it matters that we understand where we are. And definitely, as I said, if we carry on our current trajectory, then things definitely look pretty bad. But evolution happens under moments of intense pressure. And we are under intense pressure. And we are seeing the old systems crumbling so fast beneath our feet. And we have no idea what will replace them. So we have, I believe, a moral responsibility to do whatever we can to envisage new and different ways of being, and then to be those. For what it's worth, when I do the what-if meditation just now, so we're in the middle of June 2020, when I spend an hour or so settling into the closest that I can get to access concentration, 
and then open the gate to what would it feel like if we got everything right. Then after the entirety of lockdown, so where are we now, 11 weeks of practising this, I'm getting to the point now where I'm feeling the kinds of heart connection that we feel when we're with a trusted friend or a group of trusted friends. When we've done something or taken part in something that needed us, where we were the linchpin, where we have done what only we could do, being the right person in the right place at the right time, as part of a group of being the right energies in the right place at the right time. And that sense of, yes, we did this, the sense of mutual appreciation, of having got things right, that feeling when it fills my heart space and spills over into the world, that is huge. And the others in the group are not all people. Some of them are, but most are from the rest of the web of life. The hill behind the house, the trees, the rocks, the red kite, the mycelial networks in the ground. That sense of genuine comradeship, of togetherness, of being part of something bigger, where each of us is essential, where we know what we need to do and we get on doing it. That sense of connection is extraordinary. And this, I believe, is what humanity is for. I believe this is what spirituality is about, is about being able to make that connection. It's about being able to fully connect with the sacred, to really let that settle what sacredness is and what being a part of sacredness is. We do not have to let ourselves be separate any longer. Day by day, moment by moment, we are being taught that that is no longer necessary and, in fact, is destructive. And so we can reach for that connection. We can be it. Nothing less is good enough now. Anyway, if you need more of a sense of how things could be, go back and listen to Abel Pearson last week. He is someone who is living that connection to the land, who is making a difference, who is growing the food and touching the lives of the people in his local area. He is doing everything that Rupert and I believe will take us forward. And that apart, there are links in the show notes to the resources from Rupert. And also I have put a link to that On Being podcast with Resma Menachem that I think is absolutely essential listening just now if we want to understand the polyvagal implications of the Black Lives Matter movement and of how we can change our felt sense of where we are. In the meantime, we will be back with another conversation next week. And until we do, thanks as ever to Caro C for the music at the head and foot of the podcast and for the sound production. Thanks to Faith Tillery for being the other half of the creative team that is Accidental Gods and for designing the website. If you want to see the wonder and the beauty of what she's created, that address is accidentalgods.life on the web. The show notes are there, the other podcasts, the visualizations and meditations in the pandemic resources, which we will leave up, even when the pandemic isn't here. And that's where you find the portal for the Accidental Gods membership program, which is a structured training designed to help us to make that connection with the all that is, and with the more than human world, so that we can ask the question, what do you want of me, and hear answers that are clear, coherent, and constructive. So if you know of anybody else who would like to be the change, who would like to be active in asking that question and living out the answers, then do send them the link. And that's it for now. See you again next week. Thank you. And goodbye.